Hello and welcome back to Your Property Podcast. My name is Michelle Cairns and with us today we have got Jilly Barlow. Hi Jilly. Hi Michelle, wonderful to be with you today. Uh, Absolute pleasure. What we're going to talk about. Oh, I am so excited about what we're going to talk about today. And I think, you know what, this is going to be a really, really important podcast for a lot of people to listen to. And the reason that we asked you to come on and speak to us today is because you have a great way about you of, of helping people get clear. And uh, before we go into that, I, I, you know, we'll get you to just introduce yourself uh, in just a second. We we knew each other from many years ago when you were actually my mentor for a year and uh, during a, a mastermind program I did. And so I've got personal knowledge of what you're like as a coach and a mentor and and how you help me get clear on my goals and and inspire me, it really help me with my own limiting beliefs. So uh, so that kind of, it's great to kind of come full circle and have you back now and and see the difference in myself having gone through, you know, the uh, the many years of, of investing and uh, and learning. So anyway, enough about me. Uh, what about you? Just to give us a quick uh, couple of minutes about yourself and who you are. Okay, so um, I was born into a family of four girls. I'm an identical twin. I was completely hopeless at school. Uh, unfortunately, we grew up believing that we were a bit of a waste of space. But in but but the bizarre thing was, in inside of me, I knew that I would be okay. I had a mindset. I don't know where it came from, where I loved life, where I just literally um, was really excited about all sorts of things that were going to happen in the future. And um, I don't know where that came from. I'm very, very different to my identical twin. But I always had a a, a passion about life and people. And from a very early age, I I wanted to help people. And I I remember one day being in the garden of my parents and and some people coming in and, and it was a a gentleman and his wife. And and, and he he was just under so much pressure to perform, to do extra work, to create more money. And 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 there was that I just wanted, I knew that from then on I wanted to make sure that I created something in advance of ever meeting anybody so that I would be able to take pressure off everybody and anybody in my world. And I feel very, very, for some reason, I had a passion to help people very young. At the age of 21, I went out to Africa where I ran safaris, which is what you do when you don't know what to do. I didn't, I mean, I was on a safari, helping on a safari company. And while I was out there, I had a dream about disabled children and mountain houses. And basically two years later, I acquired my very first property, which is the one you can see behind me, which I still have today. And uh, a year later, I took my first group of disabled children out there. We set up, or I set up Sada, Sophia's Alpine Disabled Adventures. The chalet is called Sophia. And in 1996, we won the Childline Award for Great Britain, which was quite bizarre, amazing, uh, an experience. I didn't even know what it was, to be perfectly honest. Um, and we went from strength to strength with the charity. It really helped children to believe in who they were, have confidence, disabled children, irrespective of their disability, if they could get to France. And we took children from the age of six to 18. And we carried on um, doing For people who can't, uh, who are just listening to this and can't see the chalet in the background, um, it was one of, you, you know, your first deal that you did, but you didn't have any knowledge of any, you know, traditional education, property education. You, you know, you hadn't really read any books on strategies or anything like that. So uh, Michelle, that was your first taste. Books. I haven't read any books, so let's get that straight. <laughs> no, it was a very bizarre one. I, the dream was very, very um, powerful for me. And my attitude was in my naivety, I'm going to do it. The question is how. And it wasn't that I wanted to tread on people to get there. It wasn't that I was being, um, you know, selfish in any way. I had just made that decision that I was going to get it. I'd now got to work out how. There were no strategies being taught in 1987. There were no strategies being taught in 1989 when I acquired it. And it was, you know, in my view, I created the strategy, although it's been going on for years and years and years, but we've only worked that one out many, many years later. And it was really exciting. I I sort of imagined stepping stones across the river from one bank to another. 
And the amazing thing was I never expected to get to the other side, but I never didn't expect to get to the other side. And from a very early age, I realized it was the journey. And on, on you know, sometimes I thought I was um, not going to be able to move forward because the stone was really sharp and pointy and I couldn't walk onto it and the door would open. And other times the rocks were so flat that I nearly drowned from pride. And, you know, I realized each time that wherever I'd got to and I thought it was going to end, I'd learned so much, you know. But in that instance, I did get to the other side. But what I learned also is that you don't necessarily go in a straight line. You've got to be flexible and be willing to to deviate and move according to what happens. Because if you are dogmatic and you absolutely go, nope, I'm going to go this way and it's the only way, that's when you will tread on people. And it is when you'll end up with no friends and feeling completely unfulfilled and empty at the other side. So it was such mm. massive learning so early on in my in my world. Well, let's fast forward to today then. So you got the first chalet back in 1989, and but you've done many, many, many deals since then. So do you want to just give people a flavour of where your portfolio is now and what your experience is? Yeah, so I've got a, a relatively large portfolio. I don't have hundreds and hundreds of houses. I've never wanted that. So I have fairly big deals. Uh, I love... Uh, you can see from the chalet, that was my first deal. It sleeps 12 people. Uh, well, sorry, it's got six bedrooms. So yeah, it sleeps 12 people. And I always, because of that, I suppose, I've always done big deals, uh, relatively big deals, not massive deals. Um, and so I don't need loads and loads of them. But every single one I've done has been a journey and everyone has been different. And because when I started, there weren't, there wasn't any education, I, I was very willing to have a bit of education, um, which I did, but I still found that I navigated and learned from experience rather than from what somebody had told me, albeit it's really important to be taught and have the right knowledge as well. So, for instance, I ended up um, converting a pub into a guest house, which turned into SA, serviced accommodation. But nobody really was teaching service accommodation when I did that. I didn't even really, well, when I took on the pub, I didn't know what service accommodation was. It was a guest house in my view. And so I learned in my first year, if I'd known what I know now in my first year, I would have either made more or saved £42,000 on one property. And so I was very inspired by that, actually, because I thought, wow, people need to know this stuff. They do. And so often they're not necessarily taught the right stuff to, to fully understand how to make that more money or save that more money, whether it's due to taxes or whatever. And I was really encouraged in what I learned so that I could pay that forward and help people. So that was serviced accommodation. So I'd acquired it on an option, a purchase lease option, and I ran it as serviced accommodation. Uh, and so for every project I find I do or I've done, unless it's a repetitive uh, one that I'm repeating, I find so much learning in doing it myself um, that I then want to go on and teach people. I think a lot of the time people don't actually do what they teach. And it's so very important to do that because we make mistakes and we stop other people making those same mistakes. Yeah. And so out of your portfolio, because the chalet was also a purchase lease option, right? So how much of your portfolio has been acquired through PLOs? Uh, most of them, I, I I would say, because my portfolio is moving all the time, and I put in offers of five, five PLOs last week. So oh. I don't doubt that I'll get one. Um, so I'm only doing PLOs now. I've decided that. Um, before now, I was doing joint ventures. If I say that since 2000, sorry, since 1989 and 2024, I have never put money into a property at all, in, except for uh, one in 2017 when I bought my only flat. Not quite sure why I did that, but anyway. And I put £38,000 into it. Before then, after then, I've never put money into a deal. So all the strategies I use are such that I don't put money in. Now, sometimes those are joint ventures whereby my JV partner will put the money in. It's just how I work because I suppose I had no money. I learn how to do it in ways whereby I don't use it. So I'd rather use my money to help other people than use it for my own projects because I know how to do it where I don't need it, if that makes sense. 
yeah, it is. So you have had not just experience in building your own portfolio and uh, acquiring deals, working with joint ventures, etc., but you've had experience teaching other people, mentoring, coaching them, and seeing so many people come through uh, over the years and how the education, property education world has changed as well that you know when you started as you said you knew of no strategies there was no formal education like there is today and fast forward to today there are an abundance so many an overwhelming amount of information and strategies so what i'd like to talk about today is let's think about two different types of people and the reason i'm asking this is because i get this at the question asked so much um that at the moment we're working on how to help people through ypn and and what we do with ypn a lot of people don't even know is we have our training programs so we've got one on hmos and service accommodation development interior design sourcing etc um but what we found was a lot of people came to us and they said well where do i start if i is which strategy is right for me and i thought wow uh, we really need to help people at the very beginning and create some sort of roadmap for them so that they can uh, you know understand which one is right which uh, which strategy is right for them so so two types of people, the first type of people who are brand new to property and they don't know what they don't know. So they don't know about all these strategies. They kind of got a feel for it, but they don't know where to start. So if we focus on them first and then the second type of person is the person who has done some training. They have gone on, you know, I, I, I want to be respectful. I, I call myself a um you know, in the past, I've been a course junkie where I've not really known what I'm doing, just go from course to course and finally got there in the end. But I, I know that feeling of just being overwhelmed. So they get to the stage where it's paralysis by analysis and they are confused and they don't know which one, which route is right for them. So first of all, for the people who are brand new, what do they do? What's the first steps that they take? Okay. So this is really, really important. And what I would say to them is, be excited and be glad because for those that are starting out in property, guess what? They've got no confusion yet. And confusion is the obviously the opposite to clarity. And we want clarity. So many people have got so many areas of confusion because they've been doing it for so long, but they never really fully understand certain elements of property. And so as a beginner, whoa, you're in a really good place. And so be excited by that. And what I want to say at the very beginning is where you are right now, you have no confusion. When you take your first step into property, make sure somebody has explained it well if you don't feel you have clarity. Don't move on until you have clarity in that area and then go to the next step and then go to the next step. And wherever en route you have confusion, gain clarity because that is the only way to to progress not at speed but at the speed at the, at the pace you want to without going to bed at night going I'm really not quite sure what I'm doing and too many people find themselves in a place of fear and we can a, 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 obliterate that or rather avoid that fear by having clarity so as a beginner first of all brilliant that's fantastic so what I would say is first of all we've got to understand what strategy means because Without with, 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 without knowing what strategy is, you can't progress. And people often think that strategy is one thing. It's how we're going to make money. And it's not the only area of strategy. Because if you're talking about how you're going to make money, you've already got the property. And we've got to get the property first. So I'd urge them to draw three columns, to look at three columns of strategy. And I'm sure within property, there are more areas of strategy, but we want to concentrate on three. One is how you're going to find leads. Two is how you're going to acquire your asset. So are you going to buy it in the normal way? Are you going to do a purchase lease option, which you will learn about? How are you going to actually buy it? Are you going to get somebody else to pay for it and do a joint venture? And the third column is how you're going to make money from that asset. Now, this is really important. So you can draw these columns and you can fill them as, with as many things as you possibly can. And then what you want to do is think about what you like. There is no point in pushing water uphill. I want you, you to, them to imagine there are two things here. One is pushing water uphill, which effectively means you're doing something that goes completely against the grain, uh, that is not line up, does not line up with your dynamics or indeed your values. 
And then the other thing is stretching yourself out your comfort zone. Two very different things. Very, very different things. If you've got something inside you that says very secretly, I'd really love to be able to do that, but you don't want to tell anyone, this is stretching yourself out of your comfort zone. If you're doing something or you're worried about doing something that makes you not want to get up in the morning, that is like causes you to tread through treacle and actually not want to begin your day, you're pushing water uphill. There's no way you're going to enjoy it. And actually, you want to enjoy what you do. You know, this is the whole point. We want to have freedom. We want to enjoy what we do. And we want to be happy because we aren't promised tomorrow. Okay, so now I want you to set that aside. Set those three columns aside. You will have heard, uh, Michelle, we hear this all the time, that it's all about location, 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 location. How many programs do we hear where it's all about location? Well, you know that I've been, that I've just learned to fly and I've just got my pilot's license. Wow, that was a bit of a mean feat in itself. However, when I'm coming on to the base, when I'm on the base and I'm about to turn on to final to land, I was taught the only thing you look at is your speed runway, speed runway, speed runway. All I look at, if I look at anything else in the cockpit, then I'm going to, I'm going to muck up. Okay. I have to concentrate on the speed, 75 knots to land and the runway. When I get to the runway, I'm now focusing on landing. So it goes speed runway, speed runway, speed runway, land. In property, it's not just location. Location on its own is as good as a smack in the face with a wet kipper. Because you could offer me a castle in an amazing place because it's a castle that's not going to fill. That's going to cost me thousands of pounds every month because I want to do HMOs and it's only going to work as serviced accommodation or it's going to work as serviced accommodation or it should be, but it's not because there's nobody visiting that area. So it can only be location and area together. So rather than runway, speed, runway, speed, runway, it's location, area, location, area, location, area. And when you've got that fully sorted and you know that you've got the right area for the right strategy to make money, it's then quantity. You said location, area. Sorry, location, uh, strategy. strategy. Location, strategy. So Location, so say that again. So location, strategy. There is no point in going, oh, I'm going to um, do HMOs in Swansea if you haven't worked out that HMOs work in Swansea. Yeah, there's no point in going, I'm going to go to Cardiff or uh, poor Wales. I don't know why I'm hitting on Wales. I'm going to go to Bristol and I'm going to do serviced accommodation. If you don't know that service accommodation is sublime, fantastic, phenomenal, amazing in Bristol. Okay, so there's no point in choosing an area without absolutely understanding that the strategy you want to use to make money, which is in your third column, is going to work in that area. All that happens is we end up putting a square peg in a round hole. Now, sometimes people do. They squeeze that square peg into a round hole. And months later, they're sitting there with their head in their hands going, why did I do this deal? And you know what? Often it's because it's an option if they're doing an option and they found an option and they're so desperate to do an option that they do it even if it doesn't work. And so for beginners, I would say, before you even go and look for a property. I say this so many times. Do you think people do it? No, they don't. So I urge you, before you go and look for a property, find your area that works amazingly with the way that you want to make money from property. So if it's service accommodation, maybe if you live in, I don't know, Brighton or Bristol or Oxford or whatever, put a pin in a map and go an hour or whatever you decide is right, north, east, south and west to find an area that is unbelievable for the strategy that you want to start using to make money. Once you've got that, you know that you're going to be looking for deals and you're not going to be going, oh, I wonder, will that work? Should I check that? You don't need to. You've done it. I mean, we need to do due diligence all the time and keep looking at it. But once you've done that, the deals will come. Finding the deals is not the problem. So let's, uh, let's take a step back then. So for, before people get to the strategy, let's say uh, for people who are new, would you recommend that they do some research into all of the main strategies and then, you know, how do they decide which one okay. is for them? Okay, so let's go to the third column, which is, as you're talking, uh, how to make money from your asset. First of all, don't just do, don't follow the Joneses. Too many people do what other people do because they think they should. You do, 
many people have a strategy they want to do. Now, I personally wouldn't do single lets and I wouldn't teach single lets because we want to make as much money from our money or from our investors' money than we can. And for those of you that don't understand, please don't worry. If you're a beginner, return on investment merely means how hard is your money working for you? So if I gave you £30,000, do you want to make 500 profit from that if you go and buy something? Or do you want to make 6000 So it's just about how hard money is working for you. If you do a single let, it won't be making, it won't be working very hard for you. Um, it will work harder for you if you buy it as an option, if you acquire it as an option. I don't want to confuse people, but you've got to be very aware of your your possible outcomes in terms of profits based on the strategy you decide to use to make money. So look down the column that you've done. So in that column, it might be single lets, it might be HMOs, it might be service accommodation, it might be full developments or flips. You know, it might be all sorts of different things, including um, freehold to leasehold, which is a second strategy on its own right before you start then doing SA maybe. Um, So they need to look at what's in the column and by process of elimination, determine what 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 there is to choose from, because they might might say, oh, I'm not doing that. Definitely not doing that. Or I'm definitely not doing that. I'll give you an example. If someone comes to me and says, I want to make £60,000, which they did once, uh, passive income a month. Well, they're gonna they're gonna get rid of single lets, aren't they? They're gonna <laughs> get rid of small HMOs, aren't they? So what happens is they end up with a smaller list to choose from. Mm. And if they're struggling to decide, that's a very clever way of doing it. But as I said, many people will have strategy that they already want to look at. And I wouldn't pick more than two. And one of them needs to be passive. And what I mean by passive is I used to think that meant quiet. But what I mean by passive is money coming in without necessarily having to do an awful lot to get it. So I like like recurring. So if you're going to passive. Yeah. yeah, So if you're going to do flips or developments, that's not passive income. It's chunks of money. So I would say only pick two. And it's okay to pick one whilst you're doing your due diligence. Don't pick more than that because they'll be addled. You do not want to confuse yourselves. The other two columns, pick as many as you like. But the third column, you need to be focused. And focus is something that's hard to do when you're learning new things. If you try to learn too much or take on too much, you'll end up grabbing at stars and not actually finding anything And foc- because you're not focusing enough. So basically what you're saying is think with the end in mind. So decide, first of all, what it is you want to achieve, how much money you need or want to aim for per month and then work backwards. So as you said, if you've got, uh, you know, 60,000 or 3,000 pounds a month, well, then you'll know that six single, that's not going to be the strategy for you. And then how much time it's going to take to get to that. So the the more money that you make, and then perhaps the less, the fewer properties that you need. Yeah. Would you say that? So you have to go for bigger deals. But then I guess it depends on there are so many, uh, there's so much to, to, I mean, we could talk all day about this. So it's it's quite a challenging topic to distill into a podcast. So there are a few elements. So understanding their strategy is one of them, understanding what they're looking to achieve and then looking at the resources they've got, whether that's time, funds, contacts, experience, or whatever that is. So how does the how do their resources play into the strategy that they choose? Okay, so just a very quick summary. They want to choose their area together with their strategy first. Okay, that's really, really important. Then, as you said, they want to look at their goal. So let's pretend it's five thousand pounds. They want to find they they want five thousand pounds at the end of the year to be coming in every month. As you said, and as Steve Covey says very well, we want to start with the end in mind. So I would suggest they have their little horizontal line with 5,000 at one end and now at the other. And in the middle, we want to break it down because 5,000 seems an awful lot of money. But to start with, we want to look at what they want as a minimum profit and still be happy for any one deal a month. So if I said to you, Michelle, what's the minimum profit you want from any one property? You might say a thousand pounds. Okay, I'm just using that as an example. Sorry, I did a little bit of a role play on my own then. But let's say you said a thousand pounds. Yeah. Somebody else might say five hundred. If they say less than that, I'd ask them to go and think about it very seriously. But 
if it was a thousand pounds and they want five at the end of the month, we know straight away that the maximum number of houses they've got to find to hit their goal in a whole year is five. Five thousand pounds, one thousand as a minimum. Now, obviously, the reason I say a maximum of five is we've agreed that that thousand is a minimum and be happy. So you're going to have some that might be 1,200 that come in or 1,500. So we know the maximum. And the reason it is five and the reason it's really good to look at that at the very beginning is because it gives clarity. So right now we know we've got to find our area and our strategy that we know works really well. We also know that we've got a maximum of five houses to find and we've got a whole year to do it. So we're going to write this little, have this little horizontal line with 5,000 at one end, now at the other. Every three months, we're going to put a socking great big telegraph post. And between the telegraph posts, we're going to have two fence posts. And these break down our tasks and our targets. Now, you might put at month six, three properties. You might put at month one, no properties, but a load of tasks that need to be done in order to hopefully get a property in maybe month two. Now, this is all fickle. And what I mean by that is property is fickle. You cannot guarantee however hard you work to get three at month six, because you might have five fall out of bed all at once. So what we want to do is want to make sure that we work backwards and aim for, and know that we're on target. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. And that we work forwards. Now, what I mean by work backwards is if somebody came to me and said, Jilly, I've looked, I'm not a builder. And if if I'm doing works on a place and the builder comes to me and says, it's going to take 12 weeks, I want to know it's going to take 12 weeks. So I will say to them, in order for it to hit the 12 week mark, where will we be at week 11? Where will we be at 10? Week 10 to be correct at week 11, week nine to be correct at 10, eight at nine, seven at eight, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end of week one, I know where we need to be. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen if it's a year's project. But first of all, the builder would shoot me before they began. But it's having an idea where you need to be in order to get to where you want to in advance. And Mm -hmm. that's what we need to do. But we also need to work forwards. Now, the way that one thing to do to start is to look at all the things you can't control. So we can't, we write a little list underneath that line. One is we can't control being gazumped by agents. We can't control investors pulling out. We can't control solicitors being slow. And we write a list of all the things we can't control. But the really exciting thing, apart from one, is that most of those things we can hope won't happen if we build good relationship. So if we have a good relationship with an agent, they're less likely to gazump us. If we have a good relationship with an investor and we've done our due diligence on that investor and we know they don't generally pull out of deals, we're more likely to find that they don't. The one thing we can't control, sadly, is banks. And so we might find that a property comes in and is valued under that that we're buying it for if we're doing a normal purchase and and, and we don't get our loan to value. But we have to put a list of all these things at the bottom. Why? Because otherwise they'll end up, you know, being cruel to themselves. You know, I can't do it. This always goes wrong. The point is we've got to be busy doing the right things. There are many people in our world, in our society and in our lives who are very busy. I mean, we are a frenetic world. Certainly our society is. But let's be busy doing the right things. And the reason we want that list of things that we can't control at the bottom is because even if you do the right things, it won't always go right. It won't all you won't always get the results because property is fickle. OK, so that's what I would do. I would look at so, our results and then we want to break down the activities and the tasks so that we know what we're doing is conducive to our end result. Well, this is really interesting because I distinctly remember this conversation that I had with you uh, at the very beginning when we worked together. And I remember you said to me, right, what, what's your goal? And I was thinking and I sort of nervously said, well, uh, you know, 5,000 a month would be incredible, uh, but I'm not really sure how I could do that. And you said, well, if you aim for 3,000 then and you don't get it, then you're going to be on 2,000, right? But if you aim for 5,000, then you're more likely to hit 3,000. So if you're more comfortable with 3,000, aim for five. And I thought, okay, all right, then we'll, we'll do that. I'll have 3,000 as a more comfortable target, but ideally aim for five. And I remember you saying about these telegraph poles of 
uh, were that you know where I needed to have these milestones along the journey along the year. Now, at the time, I had no clue how I was going to get to the three thousand, and I thought this it's all very fuzzy in my brain. I thought, well, I understand it's possible because I've heard all the stories and I've seen other people do it, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. Now, I ended up smashing that in the first year, as you know, but. Um, but I think what's really helpful for me was to actually not even focus on the 3,000 or the 5,000, like, okay, have it there as, as what you're aiming towards. But as you said, you're not focusing on the results, you're focusing on the activities and the tasks that you're doing every day. So focusing on the execution, not, oh, how many deals have I got? Or what's the solicitor doing? So so for people who who have that in mind and they can, they've got their goal, what are the activities or tasks that they should be focusing on at the beginning of their journey? So then we go back to the three columns. So if I was um, mentoring or coaching or, or, or doing a program and I'd been with people in a room and I said, right, this is what you need to do this month. If you want to hit that little fence post, the first fence post, you've just got to sort your head out and you've got to sort out what you want to do. So the very first things they do is they do their their goals. So they've got the 5,000, we'll call it 5,000. They know they want to do it. They've got the telegraph post. In that first month, they need to look at their three columns, fill those three columns out with as many things as they can think of, not just the ones they want to do. We want to fill them. And then they need to tick the ones they like. OK, this is really important. And this is the same for many, many other people. It'll be what I say for those that are in overwhelm. Go back to your three columns, which many people won't have ever done. OK, and look at what you enjoy. So for me in the first column, you know, I'll give some examples. HMO letters, solicitors, networking, postcards, leaflets, adverts, right move, et cetera, et cetera. Walking yeah. the streets, all these different um, ways of finding leads. Now, you'll never find me doing leafleting. There's nothing wrong with leafleting, but it doesn't line up with me. And so I would do, I remember being told, design your leaflet. So I did after three months and copied somebody else's. Doesn't matter, does it? But did I ever print it? You could be joking because that would mean using them. Now, there are many people that do leafleting and they get on really well with it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with it. It's about what lines up with your values. So I tell people to do their values. If they don't know what that means, DM me, because it's really important to do your values. When somebody asks me, I've got a clue what they're talking about. So I wouldn't do leafleting. There are other ones like the postcards, leafleting, postcards, leafleting, adverts, HMO letters, networking. They're all good lead. They're all good ways of finding leads, aren't they? But there's one thing wrong with them. The one thing wrong with them is you're not in control of anything that comes in. You're you're waiting, you're waiting. So I say, tick everything that you want on that list. There's nothing wrong with them. And if you do leafleting, make sure it's done every six weeks. You know, make sure, sorry, that it's done every week, but you're you're you get back to the same area every six weeks. It's got to be it's got to be constant. There's no point in going. Oh, I did it for two weeks. You've got to have that rolling in the background. If you're doing HMO letters, maybe send them out every couple of weeks. But you've got to be keeping this going and deem them all as a bonus. If you want to find 10 leads a week that are potentially going to work for you, you've got to have a way of getting those leads and being in control of getting those leads. And so you've got to work out ways of doing that. You may walk around the streets where you know there are loads and loads of houses with several for sale signs outside them, et cetera, et cetera. Or you may go to agents. A lot of people are scared of using agents. I have a specific way of using uh, Google online, but there are many ways of finding leads through the internet that you can control every single week, okay? But in that first column, tick the things you like. Don't tick the things you don't because they won't get you anywhere. In the second column, most people will go, you know, for those that don't have money, well, what am I going to be able to do? Well, actually. So just a reminder. So the first column is how you are getting the leads. And the yep. second column, the second column is how, how you're going to you, acquire. Yeah, how you're going to acquire. And notice I say acquire, not buy. OK, it's really important when you're writing HMO letters, when you're doing all sorts of different things. The word acquire is a far better word because it gives you a broad spectrum of different strategy. So in that column, you would have normal purchase, not on my watch. Um, you'd have purchase lease options and purchase options, which are different. You'd have rent to rents. 
You might have uh, delayed um, completions. You might have joint ventures. You might have deferred considerations. You might have all sorts of different things. Okay. And for the most part, people can actually tick pretty much every single one other than a purchase if they've got no purchase on their own, if they've got no money. Okay, so don't believe for one minute that if you're short of money, you can't do an awful lot. of. There are many ways of acquiring deals. So you can pick as many of those as you want. Then in the third column, which is strategy on how to make money from the asset that you've just acquired. Again, I would say pick two as a maximum, making sure one is passive. So at the very beginning of your journey, this is what you need to do, because you know what? You've now got clarity you could, anyone can do this in the space of half an hour, as long as they know what we're going to do. So uh, we've just touched on a few of these. There's many ways. So what we'll do is uh, if anyone's interested in getting a free copy of this all filled out, so definitely do it on your own first, just as to go through the example. But then I'll put a link in the show notes and people can download a free guide and we'll put all of this in like a one page, just one page with the three columns. And you can see because a lot of people won't even know what the you know assisted sales are or um you know the edc there's, there's lots of other things that we can um that people won't know about so it's useful to have as a, a guide so um okay so people now have got their strategy and they've got two ways to make money through and might the be HMOs or, absolutely and the so. exciting thing is is when they tick the ones they want in short they've now got they know at the very beginning of their journey how they're going to find their leads how they're going to acquire the asset and how they're going to make money. And that is clarity in its best form. And if you can start your journey with those three things and know them and stick to them, it doesn't mean you can't move the boundaries or change things if you decide you don't like one of the strategies you've picked. But if you start with that, you are prepared. The next thing they need to prepare is their heads. And that's a hard one because a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of knowledge out there knowledge is not difficult to find how it's relay you know how people share that knowledge is really important because it can be very complicated or it can be simple property is simple and if you know we're getting on to those that are feeling an overwhelm in a minute but if people are confused it's because they it's either been explained badly so you can shoot me or it's because you know they they've got so confused that it's just a it's just you know getting more and more confusing for them But property is simple. And this is many of the time the the reason people can't create, use that knowledge to then get to their goal is their heads. And we are all unique. I'm an identical twin, so I'm the least unique on on the planet, but I am really, really unique. Sarah and I like chalk and cheese in many, many ways. So how we learn and retain knowledge. So I... I retained stuff about property like it it was my breath. I mean, I, I, I just find it very, very, I don't know why, but I want to learn languages and I really find it hard to retain languages. We're all different, you know? And so it's never about someone being hopeless, but we've got to look individual minds and see what's causing them to not understand, retain or believe in themselves. And so you know, I believe it's really important to look at. And so I always say to people, go away and write down on a day where you're feeling a little bit glum. So don't do it when you're in high spirits. All the reasons you believe you can't, you can't succeed. This is really important. And I know it seems negative, but it's about the individual. Why, why do they think, you know, in that, that little voice in the back of their head that's saying, you'll never do this. That little voice in their head that's going, well, you might, but you never hit that goal. Or the voice that says, mm, is it uh, the sceptical voice that says purchase lease options must be you know, bad because they're, you know, it's too good to be true. We need to get rid of all that scepticism. This is about integrity. It's about transparency, not just honesty. It's about empathy and it's about enthusiasm. And you can't be those four things if in your head you're thinking, no, oh, this is a bit of a bit of you know too good to be true or I'm I'm no good so we've got to look at how we can stop that so I say pull it all out of your head and then I'd very carefully put subtitles down and decide when you look at what you've written does it fall under negativity lack of motivation need for perfectionism which falls under fear which is a big one 
or lack of self-worth and self-belief. Those are generally the six that we, we, we look at, but you may have your own. And when you've, you highlight where they fall, because we've got to look at, if you're negative, it may that be that you're not negative, but there are people around you that are negative. We need to try really hard to annihilate these problems against property. You'll find it will really help with your whole life anyway. Now, this is a, a big exercise to do, but it is only an exercise. And so what I advise people to do is do that beginning of their journey so that they get themselves into a place where on the starting block. OK, and then they will find that the knowledge is far easier to turn to turn in. You know, action is far easier to take based on their own mind because they've got the knowledge. Then what they need to do is make sure they're in a really good supportive environment like you create. Because that is also crucial. Yeah, it really is. So, okay, there's so many different avenues that can go down. I'm just trying to pick a few that are going to be useful for most people. So you've, we've got a list of things that fears or limiting beliefs. So belief that I can't do it because I don't have the experience. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too, I don't have enough time, whatever it is. So then, so let's say I don't know what I'm doing, right? Imposter syndrome is a, is a popular one. And that fear of not knowing what to do. Once they understand that that's a fear for them, then what's your advice? Do they go out and just kind of target their key limiting beliefs, the ones that are really holding them back? And how do they how do they get over it or, or work through it? Well, if it's just that they don't know what to do, um, it, imposter syndrome is slightly different. If they don't know what to do, uh, then it's about structuring their time. And, and really, it's about being in groups, WhatsApp groups, groups that you create, et cetera, where they can say, where do I start? So we've already looked at two major points of where they start. If in the mindset they are saying, I don't know what to do, they're sort of not listening because we've told them what to do. But if it's that they're scared and there's fear, we've got to look at what that fear is. So many people are scared of failure. OK, many people are scared of success which we, which those that are scared of failure can't imagine that you'd be scared of success. But there are people. Many people are scared of losing their money. Many people are scared of losing someone else's money. And there are many, many fears. So we've got to take those fears and say, good, come on then, let's have a look at this. Scared, being scared of failure will probably relate to feeling they failed in the past or um, being told that they're no good, or it will be words spoken over them. And one of the really powerful things to do is remember and write down all these negative thoughts where they've come, not where they've come from, but what they are, and write down the opposite. So it's really important to have affirmations. So I, I used to think, oh my gosh, I've got to read those every day. But I tell you what, it's really important. I'm going to give you a really bizarre story. So many years ago, with regard to the chalet, I had a dream, didn't I, in Africa? Well, the two years later, when I was in the French ski resort, I ended up going to an, an estate agent. And I said for many, many years that I had a, the dream a second time. And I went into the estate agent. I don't think I had a dream. I think it was a good story that I said for many years. I had a very good reason to go into an estate agent because of an event that happened on the mountains. And I decided not to go back up. I'm being completely honest here. But you know what? The reason I started to believe I'd had the dream a second time, and I may have done, but I don't think I did, was because I said it so many times, you know? And we, the more we say things, the more we believe them. It is so true. So it's really important that they write down affirmations, but they're not going to write those down until they realize what they have believed for so long, write it down, and then write the opposite of that. Yeah. So if they believe they're hopeless, they're going to say they're amazing. If they believe that because they've not achieved before and they're likely to fail again, they need to write down that they're going to succeed. You know, they need to start writing. It's very, it's very, they're little exercises. They're little exercises. That's all they are. But they're so powerful if they're done. If they're scared of losing their money, don't use it. I love that one. You know, it's <laughs> simple. You know, don't don't use yeah. it. Because ultimately, whatever the, uh, you know, we don't want to be rude, but sometimes we just call it an excuse, right? So whatever the excuse is, whether it is I don't have the money or I don't have the education, like somebody else has had that reason and they've gone out and done it anyway. So they've fixed that, they've found the solution, they've gone out and made it happen in spite of that belief, right? So it's it's understanding, it's going back to what you said about 
what can you control what's what is in your uh sphere of control or influence and then just forgetting about the other things so even if you don't really believe that you can actually uh the fact that you know it's possible and that someone else has done it so if it's i i don't understand what to do okay well i can go out and i can learn i can find there's plenty of free resources plenty of ways that i can learn and get myself going and get myself give myself the momentum to you know to get on the journey and get and keep going it is absolutely self belief when i started off in property i had i you know i was working in a fish farm gutting fish i'd come out of school at 16 i got co level in music and everything else was unqualified not proud of it but the point is i had no money when I got that chalet that, that you can see, I'm not sure if the others will be able to see it when the podcast is on. I I couldn't afford the door of a car. And the thing the thing is, is that a lot of people in situations where they don't only don't have money, but they don't have support. I had no support. Support, you know, all the way through for many, many, many years, there was no support in, in my own circle. That's why you have to go and find support and be in environments that are really good. But it is all about self-belief. And the reason I mentioned as well the flying, not only because I wanted to talk about the runway and the speed, et cetera, regarding uh, area and strategy, but also, you know, I believe I'm severely dyslexic and dyspraxic. Going, The last exams I did was when I was 16 on my O-levels, to shows my age. And so to go and do exams to, to, to fly an aeroplane was beyond my comprehension. But I was not going to quit. And if if I can do that and get my head around that, honestly, you guys out there can do property. But you've got to decide that you're going to. And I explained, you know how I said earlier, uh, when I first got the chalet, I said, I'm going to do it. The question is how. I want you to imagine a really steep mountain. The I'm going to do it is when you're at the top. Because too many people are going, can I? Will, will, will I succeed? Will I do it? Well, mm. I, I won't manage that. When you get to the top of saying, I'm going to do it, the question is how is the exciting part? Because that's the creative bit. That's the bit where we do look at strategy and we do look at what rocks your boat, what makes you feel excited. We do look at how it might work and how you can work out your area versus your your, your strategy to make money. But that I'm going to do it is the steep climb. And that's because the I'm going to do it is the mindset. When you get to a point of saying, I'm going to do it, the, the rest, you know, the rest is in, in a way a downhill run or walk or ride. It's, I think it's coming back to what you were saying about everyone's unique and everyone's got their own way of learning, their own way of, you know, just how they operate, I guess, their own values, as you said. And I think some people, they like the idea of like that big goal, you know, the 5K a month or 10K a month or 60K a month or whatever it is. And that's something that motivates them and they'll find a way. For other people, it might be, I'm I'm this person where I just need to know what the next two steps are and then the next two steps and then the next two steps. So I it kind of scares me that those big goals because I'm just thinking, oh, I, I'm not sure if I, I can do that, right? I think I've got something in me that's like, I know it's possible because I've seen other people do it. So that's something that's really helpful for me. So that I kind of keep that in my mind of like, it's possible. I've just got to do the right things. So um, so that's important. But you know, some people just get lost, don't they? Because they are doing the wrong, uh, they, they kind of have got the wrong strategy for motivating themselves and or they don't have a big enough reason why. So maybe they're, you know, they're too kind of comfortable where they're at. And for me, it was, you know, when I kind of made the big change in, in my property journey, I was really struggling with, I was teaching full time and I felt really trapped in my job. I didn't know how to get out. And I just thought I've got to make this work one way or another because I can't carry on until I'm 68 teaching. I've got to get out. I've got to get out now. And I, and how do I make that work? And so I, did everything that I could think of anyone, you know, I, I I put complete trust in the process. So I, you know, worked with people like yourself and I just had to believe that it was possible and do the next thing. So taking massive action on doing the right thing and other people are different, right? Other people, you know, uh, they, they're more motivated by the big goal or whatever that is. So 
uh, understanding how you're motivated, I think is really important as well. Would and understanding if you're not motivated. So you, you know, we talked, I talked earlier about um, the reasons why uh, people can't do it and they need to put them under sub subtitles, really subheadings. One of them is lack of motivation. And I always say to people, imagine you're on a stage and we're in the middle of the stage. The left hand side of that stage is a place that nobody wants to go to because it's their idea of sheer hell. And although this sounds negative, if you haven't been there, you don't imagine it. So you imagine you're, going, you're you know, you're never going to die. You're never going to get sick. Nobody you love is ever going to get sick. You're never going to have a financial issue, et cetera. And we have to imagine that in order to push towards the right, which is our financial freedom, social freedom, emotional freedom, whatever freedom it is that people want. OK, and now what happens is a lot of people get to the left and they catapult to the right or they sink with the ship. What I mean by that is it, it means that they they just accept life as mediocre. This is my lot in life. And, you know, people should never, ever just go, well, you know, I'm me. And, and they become a victim where they go, this is just typical, typical that it happens to me. And we've got to get out of that victim mode. So they either become victims or they just quit. They give up and they go, this is my lot in life. And I will just accept that. It's too hard. I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, other people are moving towards the right, which is great. But one thing that that, that, that I said at the beginning then was that we're in the middle. We're never in the middle because one thing we're never going to get back is time. So for every day that goes past, whether we've whether we're not going to be here in two days or whether we're not going to be here in 50 days, our days are 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 going down in in those that we have left. So we can't control time. We can't make it stand still. So they're either going to the left or they're going to the right. Now, when people listen to the podcast and and, and get involved in good in, in in good environments, they are already going to the right. Does that mean that they won't take three steps forward and find that they're going four steps back if they're not doing the right things and they're being busy doing the wrong things? Of course not, but they're trying. Now, we want to be in a situation where we can see people and people can see for themselves that the efforts they're making are actually getting them further towards the right than taking a lot longer and going backwards and then a bit further forwards and then backwards or indeed going to the left. So in order to not go to the left, we've got to be very careful who we listen to. But one of the mm -hmm. things that that stops people from succeeding more than anything else is lack of perseverance. You see, they'll go, well, I tried for two weeks. You, you can't try for two weeks, two weeks, you know, and I go back to the same old, same old, which is probably boring to the ear. Edison may have taken a thousand attempts or 10,000 attempts. But do you think he found it hard on the way? We don't remember that. We don't remember the sacrifices or even know of them. We don't know how many times he had a meltdown, but he never quit. We look at Tom, what's his name? Carey, Jim Carey. He was homeless, completely homeless. We don't know how long he was homeless or indeed what he went through on the streets. But he wrote himself a check that was fake and said, I'm not ripping this up until the day I get the check with this amount on it. And he was determined. How many people do you think passed him by in the streets? How many people decided he was scum? We don't know what he went through. Agatha Christie, 70 million novels sold, and she was severely dyslexic. But the point is, what makes us different that we shouldn't push on? And I, I find people go, well, I tried for two weeks, Julie, and I, you know, I got 10 leads in for two weeks and I still didn't get an option. Two weeks? Well, that's as long as a holiday, you know, come on. And resilience and perseverance are monumental in the terms yes. in, in the world of property, probably business as a whole, but certainly on your property journey. You've got to be resilient and persistent. You've got and to be yes. consistent. I think that comes back to what you were saying about the things that you can't control. I think once you understand that sisters are going to be slow and tenants aren't going to pay sometimes and these things are going to happen they're not they're outside of your control and then you can expect them to happen and if they don't great but also when they do happen then you're like oh okay this is the part where the sister is low i just have to deal with it and i have to build that time into the deal 
so that you're not getting frustrated. I see so many people getting frustrated and it's, you know, it's not easy. And I think yeah, obviously the, the perils of social media where everyone just posts like the, the best things that are happening uh, makes it tough because people think, oh, it's easy. And that person's just got the portfolio by magic. And, you know, and, and especially some education companies, and they'll say, this isn't, you know, just do this and then you can get that. And it's, it, it's sold too easily. You don't really understand that there is a lot to it. Now, it's not to say that it can't be done. But you do need that perseverance to keep going. If it was super easy, like everyone would be doing it. If it was easy as just stacking shelves in Tesco, like everyone would do it. But there are more challenges that are, you know, pitfalls and the things to look out for. And, and you can lose a lot of money. Uh, you can make a lot of money as well. So there's there's a lot more to it. But as you as you say there, having the persistence. And I think it's so important at the very beginning of the journey because at the very beginning, you don't have the results. It's like, great, once you get your first deal. And I remember thinking the first rent to rent deal that I had, and I was like, oh, I just need this first one. I just need this first one because then it'll be real. And then I'll understand that it's possible, which is what happened. And I got the first one. I was like, well, that was easy. <laughs> what was the big deal? Right. But, but before then you have to have that resilience to get to that stage. Cause once you get to that stage, you've got the momentum, right. And you've got the belief and the proof of concept that it works but before that the it's very easy to get distracted and and disheartened because you don't feel like you're making the success and making the progress that you want actually you are just the farmer planting the seeds and there's a compound effect sometimes of time that's needed in order to make sure you do the right things so that you do get the results in the long term absolutely and, so. and you know i i i think that a lot of people don't understand risk analysis. And I don't want to overcomplicate things now because risk analysis, oh my word, believe you me, in the world of Jilly, it all has to be simple. It's so simple and it's not the same as due diligence. And I always say, we've got to prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And it's the same in everything. So as yeah. long as you prepare in your head that these people might let you down, et cetera, et cetera, and the deals may fall out of bed, but hope for the best, hope is a great thing. We, we do the right stuff to give ourselves every opportunity, but it's certainly in the mind. And when people make effort for a certain amount of time and then give up, they don't realize that this is not about a fish on a plate. It's not served for you. It's about having the stamina. It's about having that resilience and saying, do you know what? I understand it might take a long time. So my middle boy, he was 16 working in Marks and Spencer's. And I used to say to him, tell him what you do. He was um, at college doing music. So in part time, he was doing Marks and Spencer. And he told this young lass who he was helping to shop because she was disabled, you know, uh, uh, about what he did. And she said, please buy my house. My my uh, landlord's just put it on the market. I've been there for 16 years. And so he asked for the details of the landlord. And that was his first option. Now, I can say it like it was a, a doddle. It took seven months because his solicitor didn't understand options. But the point is, Josh pushed on and pushed on and pushed on and pushed on. And sometimes he was very blessed in that his first deal turned out to be a, a, a great deal. And it worked. His first lead, sorry. No, no, it wasn't his first lead, but very close to being his first lead. But we've got to understand that it's all about quantity. You know, well, I say it's all about quantity. It, Eventually it is. So if you've got your air in your strategy, you've got to keep going with the quantity. And I always say to people, if you let's just say options for this moment, if you offer 10 options a week, I honestly believe you'll get one a month. Now, it might be that you get none in a month and you get two the following month. So who's going to carry on? Who's going to be bothered to persevere? Because two options could be enough money for the rest of your life if you're doing big deals. And when we look at options bringing in between five and 10 grand profit a month, well, for most people, that's enough. For a lot of people, that's enough. And so are you going to be prepared? Are you going to be prepared to say, I'm going to do 10 a week or whatever I can? 10 a week does not take up a lot of time. I've taught my, my mentees and my children to watch a movie and know how to find 10 potential leads. And then make sure that they're put into a funnel that creates self-accountability and complete and utter continual motion in terms of the wheels turning. And this is really, really important. 
It is chilly. We could be talking all day and I'm conscious of time. We th- There's so much we can go into and we are going to. So we are going to be working together in the near future on how to help people with getting this clarity because it is so needed. It is so important right now with how the, you know, how people come into the property education world and how they understand where they need to spend their time so um for anyone who is interested in working with Jillia working with us going forward then there'll be links in the show notes about uh, how to do that so remember to get your free guide as well so click the link in the uh, show notes for your free strategy guide about the three columns uh, all explained I think once you see it then it's, you know, some people need to be a, a bit more visual and then they need to see something in order to understand that you'll get it. It'll be like an aha moment. And uh, and it's just about having all these tools. And, it, you know, going back to what you said about people listening to this podcast, they are or watching it. You guys are already making the right choices in terms of putting yourself in the right environment, hearing about other people's successes and, and how they deal with challenges, how they work out what to do with their clarity so uh, that community that environment is is so much do you want to just should we just finish on the importance of community and the clarity for for mindset and belief in what's possible absolutely you know property is a very lonely business if you do it on your own it's not only lonely when when you know it all goes peak tong you've got no one to you know, no one's shoulder, you've got nobody to help you get off the ground, you know, because it's never life and death. You know, when we make mistakes, we grow out of it, but we need somebody to say, come on, get up, we're going to brush you off. You're going to learn from it, you're going to grow out of it, you're going to help people through it, because you've been through it. You know, our hope is that when you join environments that are good, that are honest, that are transparent, that have empathy, that want to show you how to do it, and in many, many times handhold you, give you the answers that you so badly want. When you find yourself in that place and we're able to pick you up and brush you off, it's so much better than being on your own when you're facing it. But the other thing is, it's about sharing the the rewards. It's about the joy. It's about share, you know, celebrating. One of the things I think is really important, Michelle, is that. Many a time, people celebrate when they get the gold. They celebrate when they get the deal. But I learned many, many years ago, we need to celebrate every success. And so I would urge people, especially people who are struggling to believe in who they are, every time something good happens, and I'm not just talking about you get an investor to give you £7 billion, or you get, you know, you just get an option on a £2 billion property. I'm talking about a good call with an agent. I'm talking about a good networking event where you you meet somebody that potentially one day you'd like to work with. I'm talking about all these things that add make up your day. And I urge you every time you, you come off a phone call or you you, you you find something on Google that is an aha moment, like you just said just now, that makes sense, that you mark it with a little mark. And then you have bundles of five. So you go one, two, three, four, and an angle one, uh, which is your fifth. And then when something goes wrong, go look at all those bundles of five that you've marked in your book and you look at how far you've come because we forget to look at how far we've come, even if it's just our mindset. You know, if you write down your affirmations and in two weeks time you're getting up and you're thinking today's a good day instead of going, oh, my gosh, look at the weather. That's that. That's a, a mark. Because slowly your mindset is changing to be one of a positive one as opposed to a little grim or negative. Many of us think we're very positive, but a lot of the time we're more negative than we realise. So celebrating successes is really important. Being part of an environment is crucial and making sure that you you understand and you you can relate to the people in that environment. Really, really key. Yeah, I've got um, a diary from that year of working with you and it's at the end of the day. Uh, all I did was just write down, call with agents, tick, like sent a letter, tick, like read one page in a book, tick. And I just write down those wins. And it was incredible. At the end, I was like, wow, I, I actually did a lot today. Like that you're, 
like for some people celebrating kind of feels like a big word they've got to do something special or whatever but actually even just acknowledging it bringing it to your awareness how many things that you are doing right because it's much easier to build on a foundation of uh you know success and and build on something that's positive rather than oh I don't know what to do today as you said or I, I, I'm no good I haven't got anything if you're like okay look what I did last yesterday I can do something today and then you get the momentum right so but one um, of the things I forgot yeah. to say just now in finishing it is that for those that do like celebrating you know it's not as I said about getting to the end and going oh we're going to go off to you know I don't know Florida for two weeks when I saw that I'd when I you know marked something off and said yeah that was really really good I celebrated now for some people that might be making a mocha or making a nice coffee that they wouldn't normally have or going for a walk around a lake what I used to do was go play the piano for two minutes now it was two minutes and I I'm nightmare I, I get my leg up on one side of the piano I relax like this and it's for Jilly is for me, I'm not a great pianist but I at all, but I would sit down and for two minutes I would play something on the piano which would take me away from my normal working environment in that moment or I would dance around the kitchen to take that, sorry, with a carrot in my hand and pretend to sing. Whatever it was, whatever you, you want to do, do it because you have succeeded in that moment. And the more people do that, the more their attitudes will change, the more it will fire them up to realise that this is going to work because, look, I did something good today. Look, I did something good again and again and again. And it's really important because when those low moments come, you can look at what you've done and what you've achieved and get yourself up off that ground and, and walk on again. And it's monumental to the mindset. We need to do that from the beginning of our, our journeys, or if we're in the middle of it, we need to start doing it because that's helping ourselves. It's no different than saying in the airplane, you put your oxygen mask on first. This is about you. It's about your world. It's about your achievements. It's about how you feel at the end of it, irrespective of who it's for in the long run financially. It's about you first. Well, Jilly, I think everyone who's listening and watching just like can feel your passion. They can hear it in your voice. They can see it. And it's uh, it's infectious. You know, I hope that everyone who's listening today and you've got to the end of this podcast, that you are feeling even better or better, that you're feeling inspired, that you're feeling like, oh, you've, you know, been reminded perhaps of something you've forgotten or you've got fresh ideas on how to move forward and being inspired to take some action today on the things that you can control and just leave the things that you can't you're too busy to you know you've got you've got too many things to do to be worrying about the things that you can't control just focus on what you can control take some action and just keep moving forward and if you keep doing that things will happen. You, you keep adjusting on the way, making sure you're on the right path and making sure you, you're taking action on the right things, of course, but that will give you the momentum and that will keep you going. So uh, on that note, Jilly, thank you so much for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure as always. And as we said, we could talk for days on this, but I mean, we probably will one day. <laughs> probably yeah. so uh thank you thank you and thanks for everyone who's listening to us today and uh as we said get your free guide uh get in touch we aren't quite ready to launch what we um the program yet but if you want to register your interest and be on the waiting list then just click the link in there as well and finally i'm not sure when we're publishing this but we do have our event on the 15th saturday the 15th of june so we hope to see you all there. I'll put a link to that in the notes as well. I will put a 20% discount link. So if you can come to our event, it's live, it's in person. It's everyone who's anyone who's in property is going to be there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you there as well. So take care for now, guys. And we'll see you next time.